Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Tuesday noon. And we have global connections. And the question before the House is how the U.S. can break Putin's hold on Ukraine. Uh, with guest uh, Carl Baker, who is Senior Advisor at Pacific Forum. Thank you for coming down, Carl. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jay. It's uh, it's it, Ukraine is sort of the topic of the day for part of the world anyway. And yeah. I think it's, and it's an important topic because it's something that has been festering for a while and it, it still hasn't been resolved. Well, let's uh, let's get the environment down. Let's look at a map and you can describe you know, the significant elements of geography we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, as you can see, you know, Ukraine borders Russia. It's sort of the, that in-between land between Europe, Western, yes, Central Europe and, and, uh, Ru and Russia. It's, part, of course, part of the old Soviet Union. In some cases, uh, there's a lot of Russians that feel that it's really the, the homeland of Russia. Of, of the Russian Empire, and so you know, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of emotion attached to that particular piece of land, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of history associated with that piece of land. Of course, on the bottom there, you see Crimea, which uh, was annexed or taken back by uh, Russia, depending on your perspective, I guess, and and that was done in 2014, which which led to the Minsk Accord, which uh, involved trying to resolve the rest of the disputes between uh, Russia and Ukraine, which is in the Donbass, which is on the eastern uh, side of, of Ukraine. And that's that area is still contested. And that's, of course, where the uh, where the Russian troops, upwards of 125,000 or so troops have been stationed and, and have been uh, massing for the last uh, couple months. And of course, the, there's uh, some dispute about what's really going on in the Donbass. Uh, on, from the Russian side, they're saying that that uh, the Ukraine hasn't kept its its part of the bargain in the Minsk agreement in that they haven't had elections. But of course, the, that's contested also because Ukraine says well, we can't have elections as long as there's uh, interference from the Russians, and the Russians say, well, we can't allow we, we can't allow you to to have a free reign. So we're going to maintain forces in that area until you have the election. So, so that's part of the contestation right now between Ukraine and, and Russia. So it's, I had it's, to guess, I would guess that that argument is poppycock. Uh, well, who's, what's, which side is poppycock? I mean, I think, I think both sides see the other side's argument as, as poppycock. You know, it's a little bit like if you go back to, to thinking about what we have in Asia, you know, it's the old debate between South Korea and North Korea about independent means for uh, achieving uh, autonomy. You know, the, the North Koreans say, well, we can't do it as long as the Americans are there. And the Americans say, well, we can't do it as long as North Korea is a threat. So in some ways, it's the same, the same principle applies here that, you know, neither side trusts the other side. And so to, to say one side is poppycock and the other is, is not is, is just not looking at it from both sides, I think. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm just letting my feelings about Putin slip out. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, we had, we had this whole experience uh, with Trump and the $400 million of military aid that was gonna go to Ukraine and uh, it got us into, gee, it got us into an impeachment, didn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> whatever happened with that? What's the upshot of all of that four years ago? Well, in fact, you know, we have delivered that $450 million worth of equipment. And, and it, so it, it, was, it was completed. The, the transaction was ultimately completed. But of course, yeah, it, it caused a lot of consternation because everyone was concerned that Trump was, was really siding with the Russians uh, for his own political benefit. And, and you know, that's sort of a, a problem in, in American politics more than it was uh, in in Europe, I mean, in, in some respects, Ukraine was was the recipient of uh, American policy, or the or the not the recipient, but the 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 casualty of American politics over what was happening between Russia and Ukraine at the time. You know, although Russia, you know, is an economy is the size of Texas, it's really not that strong an economy. Yeah. Um, having 125,000 troops on the border must be somewhat intimidating to Zelensky. And I wonder how strong he is. I wonder how well equipped he is. I wonder how um, committed his army and his, his military forces are and whether he is really prepared to deal with them. You know, to me, it sounds like the elephant and the fly. Could he deal with them? 
Well, I, uh, yes, I think he could. I think I think that Ukraine ultimately is is you know it's it, it's not it's not it's not going to go toe to toe with the Russians to maintain its territorial integrity. But I think what it it will do is if if Russia would invade Ukraine. There would be a lot of resistance, and it would become, you know, a real quagmire for the Russians to try to control all of Ukraine. Certainly, again, you know, but again, this is mostly about the Donbas. It's mostly about that that eastern part of Ukraine that 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 there's that the Russians feel that that this is an opportunity to to kind of poke at Ukraine, and Ukraine is is really concerned about the separatists in in that particular region because you know that, that that's and that's why the elections haven't been haven't been held because there, there is concern about the separatists. And yes, the Russians are, you know, they've talked about the little green men in that region. And, you know, and clearly there's there's Russian support for those separatists in, in the Donbass because, uh, you know, Putin, it, it is in Putin's interest to see Ukraine fail to the extent that he can make that happen. And so, you know, and that's where, that's where it becomes complicated because, you know, the, the United States has, has in some ways, two choices. You know, I mean, uh, if if you want to talk a little bit about uh, the article that uh, Alexander Vindman Vindman wrote in uh, the New York Times, his argument was the United States needs to act independently and and move forcefully on on Ukraine and sort of leave uh, NATO aside because NATO is is not committed. And he he somewhat was critical of of Biden's approach to stay within the confines of NATO. And he kind of misquotes Biden's intent because what, what Biden had said is, look, we need to work this through NATO. And, and Vindman said that Biden, well, what Biden meant was to uh, stop at the end of NATO's uh, commitment. But that's really not what he said. He said, we really need to work through NATO. You know, and if you remember back in 2014, there was a, a particular person, uh, Victoria Newland, who is now uh, Deputy Assistant or Deputy Secretary for Policy, who made a rather vulgar comment about the Europeans. And I think that that Vindman sort of falls in that same category, that he's being a little bit dismissive of what uh, the, the European countries, both through NATO and through the European Union, can do to prevent Putin from taking those steps. So, you know, I think, and I think the, in, the last, in the last week since that Vinman article, I think that actually NATO and the European Union have stepped up, especially in the case of Germany, which has said, look, if you, if you really don't back off from this, this threat of, of aggression, then we are going to cancel Nord Stream 2. We're not going to accept the, the, the gas through that pipeline. And, and you're going to suffer economically. And I think that that is where Putin is vulnerable. Now, that's huge because they spent, the Russians spent a fortune building the pipeline. Um, it's already done, as I understand. Uh, it cost them billions to do it. And they were relying on sales of uh, gas to Western Europe, to Germany. Um, so if they can't realize that they've lost the investment, at least for a while, and they've lost the income from selling the gas, and they need that. They, they they do because because Russia is vulnerable. Russia does depend on that on that uh, export of of natural resources. As you know, they're they're not they're they're not the empire that uh, Putin would like him to be, and so that that does make them vulnerable. And of course, the other thing it does is it makes uh, Putin vulnerable to uh, dissatisfaction with the oligarchs that that run those oil companies. You know, and that's that's ultimately uh, his source of power is being able to satisfy the oligarchs. So I think you know what 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 the Biden administration has done, I think, is correct because they they have focused on the economic aspects. You know, Vindman Vindman said, "Oh, we need to deploy a division of military uh, uh, army division, you know, out of cycle into the region." And I think that that just sends the wrong signal because the other thing that that Putin would love to do in this context is, is get some separation between the European countries and the United States. Because as much as he, he would like to see the Ukraine fail, he would even more like to see NATO fail. And I think by, by getting a little bit too far ahead in your skis for the Americans in this case, and, and not, not 
work through the Europeans and with the Europeans, uh, I think you have a real risk of, of doing that. You know, and so that's, you know, that ultimately is, is where I think the, the, the more mature American approach is, look, we aren't, we aren't the, the power we were back in the 90s where we could actually dictate terms in, in cases a long ways away from the United States. We really have to depend on the Europeans because if you start imposing unilateral sanctions on, you, on, on the Russians without, without commitment from, from the Europeans, it's gonna be very difficult. In fact, you know, it, it really sort of, sort of puts us in a very vulnerable pitch, position because then there's, there's people in the European Union that will take advantage of, of, the, Euro, of the American sanctions and promote uh, European interest in that context. Yeah, they won't back us up and uh, our relationship will be strained. Um, they won't back us up on this or other things too. Right. So that's a real problem. Um, but let, let, you know, let, me, let me unpack on two sides of that. Uh, one is uh, Vindman may be you know, frustrated with Biden's lack of aggressiveness. Uh, he wants him to do stuff. He, he doesn't like Russia much. And you could tell that from his testimony back when. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he doesn't like the relationship that Trump and Trump's friends had with Russia. He wants to cut that off. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and he doesn't like Russia's interference in our affairs and our voting. Uh, he wants to cut that off. So he's, he's angry at Russia and he wants Biden to take a more aggressive posture. But mm -hmm. as you say, there's risk attached to that. And the, and the risk I want to ask you about is, is war. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems to me that, um, you know, the world is very antsy and anxious these days. And the possibility, the thought of war seems to be a little more ubiquitous than it was in various places in the world. Um, how risky is it? How, how much risk do we have of offending, that may be a, a, the wrong term, but offending the Russians to the point where we actually get into a shooting war with Russia? Well, I think I think taking taking aggressive actions that that are seen as as contradicting what the European Union and what NATO are doing would would certainly push us in that direction because then then the argument becomes is Putin's going to take advantage of of the lack of cooperation between the Americans and the Europeans and and take advantage and move move troops into the Donbas. So I think you know I think that that that's really where the risk lies. I think if 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 the United States and Europe can put together a package of of threats which which we've done with economic threats. Nord Stream 2 cut off from the, from the SWIFT, the, the financial messaging system that allows you to do international banking and allows the oligarchs to transfer money in and out of the United States, taking those things away from Russia puts them in a very difficult spot. And then suddenly they're having to deal with a, with an inflated ruble and, and uh, an inability to sell natural resources in, into Europe. So I think that, that the real risk is, is just trying to get a little too far ahead of this. Now, you know, and, and Putin is always is always watching. I mean, he's he's very much uh, a, a person who who is always seeking the advantage in that relationship uh, in Europe. And so, you know, yes, he's concerned about about uh, NATO expansion into into the Ukraine. That was the basis for him saying that he wanted to uh, have some kind of guarantee. But I don't think we need to give that guarantee. But what we do need to do is we need to encourage, number one, we need to encourage the Europeans to stand by their commitments to, to the economic threats. And second, we really need the Ukrainians to step up and, and take some responsibility for, for at least thinking about what to do with the Minsk Accords. Because right now, you know, Ukraine isn't really doing very much. And the United States could also get involved, more involved and more encouraging about trying to move the, the Minsk Accord forward. And if, and if they can't work, then, then maybe we need to think about how do we improve that? How do we, how do, we do something so that we can actually implement those, those agreements? And if they can't be, then we probably need to start thinking about uh, maybe participating in, in some dialogue to allow that to move forward. I, I keep thinking that, um, you know, uh, Putin, with all his intelligence background and with all his intelligence apparatus that he has, um, and the fact that we live in a, you know, a, a transparent country, in large part, he knows much more about us than we know about what goes on in the inside of the Kremlin. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure we know something, but I'm sure he he can see clearly not only into the way our government works, but it's the way our public opinion works. Mm -hmm. um, that's all we wear it on our sleeve every day. And he knows that there's no appetite uh, for getting, you know, involved militarily in somebody else's problem. I mean, it, it, even talking about the fact that Ukraine hasn't stepped up uh, as much as we want, uh, it, it sounds like Afghanistan, maybe on a lesser level, but it sounds like Afghanistan. And I would suggest that there is really no uh, public opinion appetite in this country and, and no appetite in, in, in Congress either, to, to the extent that appetite still exists in Congress. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. clear. <laughs> but but to, to have a war or a situation, call it a, um, you know, uh, call it a foreign, a foreign relations situation where we put more money, more time, more, may I say, boots on the ground into somebody's foreign, uh, foreign entanglement. Um, and, I, and I think that people would oppose that. And he knows that. So to the extent that uh, Vindman is suggesting any of that, that sounds to me like a dead end because, because Congress and the people will not go along with it, uh, even aside from what NATO has in mind or what, how it would react to the this, this circumstance. Don't you agree? We are, we are totally transparent and therefore, um, you know, we, we are not going to be involved in a foreign entanglement right now. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say we're totally transparent, but we're certainly uh, more transparent than than, uh, the, than the Russians are on this. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's right. I think, I th and that's why I'm. That's why I think you know the real, the wise choice is is to be very careful that it's the Europeans up front in this situation, and it's not us trying to get ahead of the Europeans, because that's. To me, that was part of what happened in 2014 when when they did in fact annex. Crimea is that is that the Americans and the and the Europeans simply weren't on the same page and there wasn't an there, we couldn't come to an agreement on how to deal with the situation and so it, Putin simply took advantage of it and and put boots on the ground and and uh, said now deal with the fate accompli yeah uh, that was impressive what he did uh, and it was you know it was also impressive what we didn't do um, yeah. and I'm sure he's looking for another opportunity just like that again. Exactly. And, and that's why I think we need to be very, very careful that we don't we don't try to get out of step with with the Europeans here. Yeah. And that's you know, that's that's always the always the tendency on the part of of, of the the Americans who uh, want to be aggressive and, and demonstrate, you know, to the to the world that the United States is going to stand up to uh, to the autarchs and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, that was another thing, you know, that Vindman tried to bring out that, that, that Ukraine has become the fulcrum of American credibility alongside Taipei or Taiwan in, uh, in, in Asia, you know, and I think that that's just an overstatement of, of the importance of Ukraine. Yes, we, we support a, a free Ukraine and yes, we're going to uh, work through NATO to, to uh, defend uh, Ukraine's interests, but, not to the point where we're sending sending a division out of cycle, which you know, yes, it's a it demonstrates a, a, a significant cost, but it's a cost that is probably lost in the in the real time drama that's unfolding in in the Donbas region. So you know, I think it's it it it, it sounds attractive to to the Americans that want to you know demonstrate power, but I think in this case uh, the the real power is the ability to cooperate and, and uh, move forward in a multilateral fashion? Uh, just the one thing occurs to me is that in recent years, um, not without a lot of skill, um, Putin has um, been doing cyber, cyber attacks on Ukraine mm -hmm. and probably a, a bunch of other places, but he's focused those attacks on Ukraine. He brought their power down and, and their government buildings and the like uh, in Kiev over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And so it's clear he has the capability of doing that. And uh, I suggest that if he was really going to go in, if he was really going to have those boots walk into the Donbass, uh, he would soften them all up. I mean, that's good military strategy um, mm. by, by, by stepping up his uh, cyber attacks, don't you think? And he could get a long way with that. He could do half the job without ever stepping across the border. Yeah, 
Well, yeah, and that's and clearly that's what he's doing now is is trying to maintain that 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 vagueness in that particular region of of are these people really going to support Zelensky or are they going to, you know, uh, call for for a, a uh, better association with the Russians, you know. So that's why that's why it all kind of you know focuses on on that particular on the Donbas because that's where that's where the real uncertainty for Ukraine lies is the ability to maintain control in that part of the country. Yeah, and they speak Russian in that part of the country. They're, you know, ethnically they are large part Russian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's that's right. And and so yes, they they do tend to to look to look to Moscow. And and so and and I think and Putin knows that. And I I, I mean my personal opinion is that that's Really, the area that that uh, Putin is focused on, he he really understands that that the the risk for him is too great to try to take on Ukraine, because just like the United States, I don't think has a stomach. Uh, the United States general population doesn't have a stomach for engaging in a war. So the Russian population doesn't really have the stomach for engaging in a in a foot soldier war in in Ukraine. Because, because the rest of Ukraine is not going to fold just because Russian troops come in. They, they would then have a fight on their hand, uh, hands, uh, you know, similar to what uh, I think Richard Haas uh, compared it to when the Russians tried to invade uh, Afghanistan. You know, at some point, the Russian population is going to become weary of that also. Hmm. And, so, and so I think that, that it, it, works, it works on both sides of, of the reluctance by the leaders to get involved in a war that is not going to be popular at home. Yeah, and I, and I wonder what would happen in Western Europe um, if he did physically attack with weapons and troops and you know tanks and mortars and um, you know fighter planes and all that stuff reminiscent of World War II and and the Blitzkrieg. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. And he comes yeah. west, just like the Brit well, the Blitzkrieg was going east, but whatever. And and um, he makes war on the people of Ukraine. Uh, will Germany stand by? Will it uh, think about sanctions or more? Will there be um, a joinder of issues, so to speak, by the Western European NATO countries, simply because they really can't stand to have a war on their border? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that both sides. I, I, ultimately, I think both sides are fairly comfortable with this sort of vagueness that surrounds uh, Belarus and and Ukraine. You know, you've got the, you've got the Baltics that have have moved into into NATO, and you know, and I think that that there's there's this sort of vague comfortableness on both sides of having Ukraine and and Belarus as somewhat somewhat uh, less defined on where where the loyalties lie it's almost like a like a dmz in some respects you know between between nato and and russia and so i think that 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 ultimately both sides are comfortable to the extent that that's a, i mean comfortable yeah. they're they're willing to live with uh the status quo in in this in this respect yeah for now uh, because P Putin is the aggressor here. I mean, I, I let me ask you this question. There's no real interest by NATO in terms of moving closer to the Russian border, is there? Well, it doesn't no, really I mean, suit their style. No, and that's and that's why there's been resistance to accept Ukraine into into NATO. You know that that's 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 why they're in the situation they are because th there's been a reluctance. You know, ever since ever since the the, the Clinton administration, for, to for the, number one for the Americans to support that uh, notion, and number two, NATO recognizes that there there are legitimate Russian interests in in maintaining a a less uh, a less Western uh, country between them and and NATO. Suppose NATO at this point, you know, as one of the various tools in the toolkit, decided to include Ukraine in NATO, so, or at least to step up the discussions in that direction. I guess uh, Putin would see that as a very aggressive, threatening move. What, at, would at the, what would the effect be, you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that would, that would somewhat force Putin's hand, is, is he, would, he would feel that, that then he has to move now because he can't, he can't wait for, for a, a later date because it's not going to get any better. And so I think that, that it would be 
it, it would it would really force Russia into a into a difficult position, and I, I don't see that that's really in anybody's interest at this point. Mm. So we talked about uh, Alexander Vindman and his very interesting article, um, maybe overstated in some ways, in the New York Times uh, about a week ago. Um, and uh, let's 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 take that off the shelf for a moment, Carl. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about you know what would happen if if Biden um, is too soft on this, that he makes a mistake of being faint-hearted and not aggressive enough. I'm not saying he should be as aggressive as, as Alexander Vindman wants him to be, mm -hmm. but he has to be at least some, he has to be somewhat tough and he has to show that he runs this country, which is very questionable these days. Mm -hmm. um, so suppose he goes in there too soft and he doesn't demonstrate the kind of will, the kind of power you need to achieve, um, you know, sanctions that work, leadership among the NATO countries in the EU that works. What happens if he make, makes a mistake in that direction? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean I, I, it's, it's a little bit hard to say. I mean, certainly I think Putin, if Putin sensed that that was the case, he would try to take advantage of it. Uh, and then the the real uh, the real wild card is what does what does NATO or what does the European Union do? You know, I mean, because ultimately the the economic sanctions are dependent on successful implementation by the European Union, and I think that that's you know something that that uh, there's a little bit of uh, uncertainty in the United States anyway of how how the European can the European Union really put together a coherent strategy that would, would effectively stop uh, Putin from moving forward. And so I think that that's, that's kind of where the unknown lies. And, and certainly it would hurt America, American credibility if, if it was viewed as, as failing to, to, to take a, a hard enough line. But I, I mean, again, it, it's, you're, you know, your hypothetical is a little bit hard to envision because I, I mean, what I've seen from the, from the Biden administration is that they recognize that they, they can't soft sell this thing, that they can't, they can't really get engaged in, in you know, going too far to, to appease the Russians. You know, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to use the word appease because, you know, that, there's always this tendency. It didn't to, go well in 1938. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. I mean, the, my, my problem with that is that, you know, everybody always wants to go back to say there's only two choices, you know, attack or appease, you know, and, and, and the, the remembering Chamberlain, you know, and, and in this case, you know, it's not it's not that black and white. It's not it's not either either, you know, defend. De de defend Ukraine or you're appeasing Russia. You know, it's, it's more complicated than that. There has to be a multilateral agreement. There has to be a, a, a sense of, of uh, multilateral action here. And, and, and so, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea of trying to reduce it to either, either attack or appease because it's just not that, it's not that straightforward. No, it's complicated. You know, we've talked here, we have a few minutes more. I'd like to ask you about one other area, uh, logically. Um, we've talked about um, uh, Putin's opportunistic style. And you gotta give him credit. I mean, he's, he, he sees options. He's a good politician, an international politician. He sees options, he evaluates options. He's always waiting, he's playing the long game. He looks for opportunities. And, you know, Xi Jinping is not that different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it seems to me that it's worthwhile just talking about the kinds of opportunities that may come Putin's way. For example, um, you know, in the in the last uh, Southern Adventure, um, he saw as an opportunity that the U.S. and the EU were not on the same page in Crimea. Um, so he saw that as a as a time and opportunity to move. Okay, there are a lot of opportunities that could happen. Um, I just name a few, and I'd be interested in your thoughts about this. For example, <clears throat> China does something aggressive, maybe on Taiwan, and it 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 steals the headlines. It sucks up all the oxygen in terms of global opinion. Um, I, I guess that might be an opportunity that Putin would move into. Likewise, if there was some kind of uh, extraordinary 
event in the United States, another insurrection, what, what have you, uh, some kind of uh, remarkable thing that happens politically or in, in terms of uh, you know social contention in the United States, uh, where that sucks up all the oxygen done the headlines around the world. Um, a, uh, a, a tremendous increase in, in COVID uh, under Omicron. Uh, we find out that it's more dangerous than we thought, you know, and we have infections going skyrocket uh, around the world and everybody's in a tizzy. Or perhaps a natural catastrophe of the kind the scientists are telling us uh, we better watch out for in any part of the world. Uh, who knows, wildfire, extreme weather, uh, something out of climate change. Um, that steals the headlines and sucks up the oxygen. Am I right to think that these kinds of things, um, even though they're distant from Ukraine, distant from you know Russia, um, they could they could present opportunities. Maybe a combination of them could present opportunities that Putin would move into and use the same kind of strategy they he used in Crimea. Sure. I mean, he, he, you know, he did it in, he did it in, in uh, Georgia, you know, in, in, uh, in, in 2008. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's always a risk, but I, I will say that I think the risk is much greater when the perturbation occurs nearby. In other words, you know, the real concern has to be stability in, in the Ukraine. You know, Zelensky has to has to be strong, and he he can't be seen as as being weak because that's that's where I think somebody like Putin would take immediate advantage when he sees when he sees a weakness there. If he sees if he sees any any level of uncertainty of of NATO support or or the European Union support for for maintaining Ukraine as an independent economy or an independent state i think that's that's where the greater risk is sure there's it is the case that if you know if there's some something that happens in the united states where the united states is is uh, uh, unlikely to to provide the support that it has provided to nato or or to ukraine separately then i think i think putin would look at that as a potential opportunity but that's why I think it's important to to maintain a, a sense of, of unity with with NATO in the context of the European continent, and that that's that's where the the least likely chance of some other ex, externality influencing what happens in Europe to to occur. That that if you if you can maintain a, a solid foundation in Europe, then then other other things that happen around other parts of the world become less likely to be seen yeah. as an opportunity. Yeah, depending on just how catastrophic they may be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, ask you one other thing. You know, it it, it it is suggested by Putin, Putin's nature and his background as a KGB and all that, um, and and what we've seen with Navalny, with the poisoning of Navalny, and there was another uh, retired uh, Soviet, uh, I shouldn't say Soviet, Russian. Um, intelligence officer who was poisoned with radioactive poison in, in, in Britain a few years ago. I mean, this is all coming from uh, the Kremlin and, and Putin. So he doesn't mind going offshore. He doesn't mind creating disturbances offshore. Uh, and as I mentioned before, he's fully capable with, you know, his, uh, his um, um, internet, you know, skill um, to bring down utilities and you know, infrastructure and the like, and he could and has done that in Ukraine. <clears throat> so suppose we have um, an event that is closer, just as you suggest, that is right across the border, such as a uh, disturbance in the government in Ukraine, uh, which is really a provocation by Putin, mm -hmm. an assassination of Zelensky or somebody else in the government in Ukraine. Uh, that would be very disturbing and it would be the kind of thing that a tumultuous thing that might set up um, um, an opportunity for him. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that has to be on his list of options. And he's he's demonstrated in the past, but he's fully capable of crossing the border and creating that kind of disturbance. What do you think about the possibility? Yes, it's an it's always a possibility, and and you know that's why that's that's why I mean I, I'll go back and say. That's why there was so much concern when 
Trump appeared ready to bolt from NATO, you know, because because that's really the mechanism that that has has sustained that stability that prevents people like Putin from doing those kinds of things. And and NATO is is the the core to the defense of Europe and and any sort of unified response in Europe, you know, absent absent NATO. The European Union has has fiddled a bit with with some sort of independent military force, but it certainly doesn't have the the the, the credibility and the potency uh, a, a force that includes the United States. So you know, so that's why I think you know it's important to recognize that while while you know territorial wars are becoming less important because of all these other threats that are out there. The fact is, is that territory does still matter. It is still a factor in, in international relations and, and that you still need these, these old fashioned uh, military forces like NATO to, to maintain some level of peace, especially in, in an area like uh, Central Europe where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty and a lot of, of uh, contested areas yet. Last last point of discussion, and maybe uh, this calls for um, you know, some things that you've already covered, but what would your advice to the administration be right now? All these things considered, all these risks and um, events and, um, you know, arguments and um, uh, and and PowerPoints. What 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 would your advice to Biden be to, to navigate uh, through the channel on this? My, well, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of uh, basically a reiteration is that you have to work the multilateral angle. You have to work through NATO and you have to work with the European Union to ensure that there's no daylight between the United States and the European powers, both economically and militarily on this issue, on, on any issue in that region, whether it be Belarus, whether it be Ukraine, whether it be you know uh, supporting supporting the Baltics, you know you have to you have to maintain a very strong multilateral unified front to to protect everybody's interests. You know that's it clear that uh, that would be the preferred approach, um, and it might always have been the preferred approach. Except something you said earlier in the program, you know, back a few years ago when we were perhaps stronger, more influential in Europe, uh, had mm, greater, mm, greater clout there, um, it might not have been the same. Your answer might be different if we were talking, say, 20 years ago. Am I right? Oh, yeah, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, and so what I'm suggesting is, is part of what I think has to become the accepted reality on the part of the Americans is that the, the, unipolar, mo the unipolar moment is gone. And, and we really need to think about how we, how we cooperate with the rest of the world to achieve the, the goals that we're after. Much more sophisticated. It's on the, it's on the soft side of soft power, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Carl Baker, uh, Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum and a, and a wonderful guest for our show. Thank you so much, Carl, and happy Christmas. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. You too. Aloha.